say thank you and welcome to today's webinar. DSHS has brought this webinar to you today in collaboration with UT Health Science Center and the Academy of Cognitive Therapy to provide some additional support in helping you prepare for the CBT competency policy that will be going live fiscal year 2014, which is September 1st of this year. We really appreciate the interest and participation that is evidenced by your attendance today. As I mentioned previously, our intention is to help equip you with some fundamental knowledge that will hopefully aid you in your preparation efforts as well as provide some insight into the tape rating process. It is our hope that you walk away from this experience with an enhanced knowledge of CBT. Our expert presenter today is Dr. Leslie Sokol, Distinguished Founding Fellow of the Academy of Cognitive Therapy. I want to extend thanks to her. Troy Thompson, who is the Executive Director of the Academy of Cognitive Therapy, and UT Health Science Center for being partners with DSHS and bringing this resource to you. So without any further ado, Dr. Leslie Sobel. Hello, everyone. Well, today I hopefully am going to be able to arm you with a very broad understanding of cognitive behavioral therapy and a very specific understanding of what we hope that you will be able to deliver in demonstrating efficacious CBT. So I'm going to start by talking specifically about the cognitive model, because what defines somebody as providing evidence-based cognitive behavior therapy is that they operate through the lens of the cognitive model. What that simply means is that it is not any given specific situation that drives distress. That what drives people's distress. So what happens is our perceptions of situations are what we call automatic thoughts. Automatic thoughts are thoughts that pop into our head. We don't necessarily reflect on them. They often co-occur with other kinds of thoughts and images that are popping in. And it is those thoughts that directly influence, don't cause, but directly influence how we feel, what behavioral actions we choose to take, and even what our physiological system is doing. Now we know that the goal of all treatment is to reduce distress. And what that typically means is to reduce the distressing affect. But unfortunately, we don't have a way to access affect directly. But we can intervene at a behavioral level, a physiological level, and at a level of thought. There's pluses and minuses. And all levels of intervention actually can play a productive role in helping a patient strive towards recovery. We can intervene at a behavioral level because we know that changing what we do often has an impact on how we think and thus how we feel. But the problem with behavioral change is often it provides a band-aid or a temporary solution. Because once we stop whatever behavior is temporarily helping us, often what happens is we regress back into the problematic situations and feelings. Physiological interventions as well, which by the way might be homeopathic, so it might be diaphragmatic slow breathing or refocusing or biofeedback, or they may be more biological physiological interventions like pharmacotherapy or ECT. Physiological interventions as well do produce symptom relief. The problem with behavioral and physiological interventions unaccompanied by cognitive change is that when you stop the intervention, when you stop the ECT, when you stop the medication, when you stop the behavior, then the symptoms reappear. So relapse is the problem. And the power of a cognitive, behavioral, physiological package is that it is the cognitive work that produces the enduring change. It is the cognitive work that prevents relapse. And it is the cognitive work that is the most powerful component in emotional change and in promoting more effective behaviors and in reducing unpleasant, unnecessary physiological arousal. But we can intervene from a cognitive perspective at two levels. At the situation-specific level, reducing immediate distress 
is about teaching people how to, number one, identify those automatic thoughts that spontaneously pop into their head, which may be in the form of a thought, but may also be in the form of an image. And instead of blindly accepting those thoughts and maybe those images as 100% valid and true and believable, to teach people to sit back and start to evaluate the validity of those thoughts, to ask whether the facts support that perspective or whether it is our immature, subjective, emotional perspective that is leading us to an inaccurate conclusion. So cognitive behavioral therapy is about evaluating the accuracy of thoughts. It's not about replacing thoughts with more positive perspectives, but it is about looking at situations through multiple perspectives so that we can gain the most positive, accurate, realistic perspective, not only on a situation we're facing, but even more importantly, when looking at ourselves. Because where do these automatic thoughts come from? Why is it that one person faces a situation and has a completely accurate and perhaps neutral perspective? Somebody doesn't say hello to you when you're walking down the hall. And one person thinks absolutely nothing about it. In fact, has a neutral response, like maybe the person didn't see me, or maybe they were preoccupied. Or maybe they were so busy rehearsing what they were going to say at the meeting that they were just not aware of anything else going on around them. On the other hand, what might lead another person to take that very personally and to think, I can't believe that person didn't say hi to me. They must not like me. Nobody likes me. I am pretty unlikable. Or maybe another person thinks, that person didn't say hi to me today. I wonder if they're mad at me. Or that person didn't say hi to me. I wonder if it's because something bad is going to happen and they're afraid to tell me. So you can see that our perceptions, yes, can shape very strong feelings, can shape our actions, but those perceptions actually come from our underlying views that we hold about ourselves. The person that's pretty confident and feeling pretty good about themselves has the capacity to see situations through a neutral lens. The person didn't see me or they were preoccupied. The person that has insecurity lurking inside of them, and perhaps in their state of clinical depression or clinical anxiety or even psychosis, that in that distressed state, they no longer see themselves in a reasonable way. They see themselves in a very negative way. Their self-confidence has diminished, and their negative self-view is very and it is that negative global self-view that leads individuals to see any given situation through an inaccurate and very negative lens. So for short-term symptomatic reduction, we look at evaluating the validity and modifying situation-specific thoughts. But for enduring change, we do spend time identifying those underlying beliefs or self-doubt that individuals hold that maybe only show up during times of stress or distress and make sure we give people the tools to recognize that self-doubt when it's operating and to be able to examine the validity of that self-doubt and replace that self-doubt with more accurate, realistic, and positive views of themselves which lead to more global self-confidence. Now, specifically, when we talk about cognitive therapy, I've already said that what defines somebody as a cognitive behavioral therapist is the model they operate under. And that model says that how we conceptualize individuals is through this lens, as we've been talking about but also how we conceptualize the problems that they are experiencing. And that is that cognitive behavioral therapists believe, regardless of the etiology of a problem, regardless of the cause, biological, traumatic, once a person is clinically impaired, clinically depressed, clinically anxious, 
that a problem in thinking exists. And to do CBT, all it really involves is understanding the person and understanding their problem. And to understand their problem, it simply means identify the distorted, erroneous, problematic perspective and replace it with an accurate, realistic perspective so that you can walk around without distress and take appropriate action. If we take a look at the slide on the cognitive model of depression, you can see that the problem in thinking when patients are depressed is that they are negatively biased. It's like somebody put dark sunglasses on and no longer sees the clear perspective. And what happens once a person is clinically dep depressed, regardless of the cause, they start to have a negatively biased view. And that negatively biased view affects three major spheres of operation. That's what we mean by the cognitive triad. They have a negative view of themselves. So rather than having a neutral perspective or seeing yourself as a whole picture with shortcomings as well as assets, all the person can see is their shortcomings. They magnify those shortcomings. They generalize those shortcomings. And all of a sudden they say, I'm a loser. I can't do anything. I've amounted to nothing. I don't measure up. I'm not a likable person. So that negative self-view takes over. They also have a negative view of their future. Because we also know that the more depressed a person becomes, the more hopeless they become. And what happens when we're hopeless? Well, hopelessness is the key ingredient in suicidal ideation. And what happens as we become more depressed, we become more negative, we become more negative about our future and hopeless, and thus we become more at risk for suicidal ideation and suicidal intent. But not only do we have a negative view of ourselves and the future, we also are start to get down on the whole world. Nobody understands. Nobody cares. Now, it's understandable that people would gain this kind of perspective because think about it. When they're depressed, what do people start doing? They stop doing. They isolate from themselves, from others. They stop going to work. They stop going to activities. They don't answer the phone. They don't initiate activities. They don't go to social engagements. Well, when you stop participating in other people's lives, they stop inviting you, you stop interacting. Of course you think nobody cares. You're not talking to anybody. How could they care? And if you're not doing anything and you're not having anything that you feel a sense of accomplishment from, of course you're going to develop a more and more negative self-view of oneself because you don't have any data to contradict that negative perspective. And that is why depression can go on for a very long period of time and we see these chronically dysphymic individuals because their negatively biased perspective has led them to more and more negative behaviors which has reinforced the negative perspective and kept them in this constant state of depression. So we can look at any psychological problem and we can look at it through the perspective of the cognitive model. Anxiety, for instance. The anxiety model is a risk resource model. It says that once patients are clinically anxious, and I, I might want to say as an aside, that anxiety in itself is not a bad thing. Because anxiety is the way that nature has fortified each of us to deal with difficult and dangerous situations. Anxiety is our pre-programmed alarm system that each of us carries around inside of us that helps us face life struggles. But what happens when we're clinically anxious is essentially our alarm is ringing unnecessarily. It's a false alarm. And the false alarm, that physiological arousal, that adrenaline that we feel pumping through our system is simply inaccurate perceptions of danger and resource. We call this the risk resource model. And that is that when anxious patients evaluate threat, 
they see situations as more dangerous than they really are. They see the probability of a dangerous event as more likely to occur than it may actually be, and they see the consequences of the event as more catastrophic than they may be. And when they look at their ability to handle these dangerous situations, because let's face it, life is filled with difficult and often dangerous situations that are sometimes very real, but often we are equipped with resources and tools and coping mechanisms that help us face those difficulties. But when we're clinically anxious, we see ourselves as helpless and unable to face those difficulties. And so we actually have an inaccurate perspective of resource. And what that means is that we see our own individual resources as minimized. We don't have the skill, we don't have the strength, we don't have the perseverance. And we fail also to see the resources that are outside of ourselves. All those outside resources at our disposal, like opportunities to get more skills or to get more information, or all those other people out there in the world. Because we're not necessarily facing things on our own. Often we have a team on our side. If we look at the cognitive model of anger, once again, all we have to do is identify the problem in thinking and correct it. The cognitive model of anger says that ang clinically ang angry individuals have a lot of should statements. They operate on expectations that take the form of imperatives. I have to, I should, I ought to, I must, I should have spent more time with my mother. I should have taken care I should not have eaten that extra piece of chocolate cake. So what happens is that we have all these demands on ourselves and on others. You should have called me. You should have shown up at my party. And what happens when people don't fulfill those shoulds, regardless of whether it's shoulds on ourselves or shoulds on others, we feel angry and frustrated. But anchors on the surface. And it is, it is rather easy to replace that anger and frustration with a lesser affect simply by removing the unrelenting demand, the imperative, and replacing it with a request. It would have been nice. I would have preferred. But anger is on the, is, is on the top. Underneath anger, the meaning behind those unfulfilled demands are really where the critical work takes place. Because what does it mean? about you as a person if you didn't do the should that you thought that you should have? Or what does it mean about you as a person? Or what's the worst thing about somebody not fulfilling the demand that you placed on them? And that meaning is often associated with either hurt or fear. And that meaning that we ascribe to any unfulfilled demand is directly related to those underlying negative views that we hold about ourselves that would lead us to make such significant conclusions from innocuous things. For instance, the person stops at the yellow light instead of driving through it, and you think you should have gone through the light. Now you're going to make me late. So they've made a personal perception about something that has nothing to do with you being the car behind them. And in fact, they very, very well may have stopped at the LA because they've recently been in a horrific car accident, and as a result, they're a much more cautious driver. So we can look at any psychological problem. Look at psychosis. It's not the hallucination or the delusion that creates the distress for individuals. It's the meaning that they ascribe to it. And the goal in CBT for psychosis is not to eliminate hallucinations or delusions. The goal is to reduce the distress associated with them. So modifying dysfunctional thinking at a situation-specific level provides immediate symptomatic relief. Modifying dysfunctional beliefs, those pervasive negative views that we hold about ourselves, that are often lifelong, 
by correcting those dysfunctional beliefs and modifying them into more healthy, positive, accurate, realistic views of oneself, people are then able to go through life having a more neutral perspective and avoiding a lot of unnecessary distress. These beliefs, the way an individual feels and behaves, is influenced by the way they structure their experiences. And I want to just share with you for a, a minute here the cognitive conceptualization diagram. Because in order to provide effective therapy, it is essential that we understand the individual that we are working on. Yes, we have to understand the problem and the problem in thinking, but if we're going to fortify people to be their own therapists and to avoid relapse, we have to understand what is the underlying negative view of themselves that makes them vulnerable to seeing the world through an inaccurate lens. And often the cognitive conceptualization diagram, which is taken from Judy Beck's books, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, Basics and Beyond, is the roadmap that we can use to understand individual people. So you can see you collect data across situations, you collect the automatic thoughts or images that they had in those specific situations, collect the affect they experienced, the behavioral response, and as you look across multiple situations, you start to identify the kinds of meanings that are being elicited, the themes that happen across situations. And those themes start to help us understand those negative self-views or those doubt labels. And then we say, where did that doubt label come from? And we look at all those relevant life experiences, particularly the childhood ones, that led the person to believe the negative thing that they do about themselves. The person that says, I'm bad. And then you find out that they were a child of an alcoholic parent that beat them and told them they were bad. It's no wonder you think you're a bad person. But the truth is, every child of adversity does not necessarily see themselves in a negative way. It is when we make the things that happen to us personal, when we ascribe personal meanings, that those negative experiences become a negative self-view. And once we've established this negative view of ourselves, we use strategies to help us compensate, to help us be able to protect ourselves. If I think, for instance, that I'm incompetent or I'm a failure, I might choose a coping strategy of trying to be perfect because I might believe the rule or the assumption is if I'm not perfect, if I make a mistake, then I'll prove to myself and everyone else what a failure or how incompetent I am. So those assumptions are simply the if-then rules that link our negative view of ourself with the strategy we choose. And if you think about the kind of typical compensatory strategies that people overuse, because what we mean by compensatory is that they use one strategy in every situation all the time, even when they no longer work. When a strategy does work, used in moderation. It's reasonable. So for instance, avoidance. Avoidance at times is a very effective strategy. Avoiding dangerous situations is probably a good idea. But avoiding life in general and never leaving your home is definitely not going to be an effective path. So we try to help people recognize that there's lots of strategies out there and you need to use as many of them as makes sense. So, Cognitive therapy involves a cognitive conceptualization of the disorder, what's the problem in thinking, and a conceptualization of the patient, what are their situation-specific thoughts and their more global underlying labels of doubt, and then uses absolutely any technique that is out there to help reach the goals that collaboratively the therapist and the, and the client have established together. And those techniques, of course, lots of cognitive techniques, and lots of behavioral experiments and exposure, and lots of experiential practice, but you can have pharmacology be part of the equation and brain stimulation and biofeedback and eye movement desensitization and DBT skill groups, and it's still cognitive therapy. Because again, it's not the technique you use 
It's the rationale for why you are using it and the goal that it is linked to. So techniques are limitless. So the basic principles of CBT, the cognitive model, how we think influences how we feel. But very importantly, in the work samples that we're going to be evaluating, we're going to be looking for the following characteristics. One is that it is goal-directed. They goals, they therapy. We are not here just to provide support, even though we do provide support. We are here as champions and allies for our clients, but that's not our only goal. We are here to teach these individuals how to help themselves. We, you know, CBT is a psychological model. It's a model of coping. What can we do to help you more effectively cope? And that means it's goal-directed, which means it's time-limited. When we've accomplished our goals, we're done, because my goal is to make you your own therapist. But the only way we're going to get work done is to be structured, to decide what we need to do, to actually do it, and to evaluate whether or not we've done it. And that's what we mean by goal-directed therapy. And it's very easy to establish goals for therapy. Essentially, a person comes in and you ask them, what brings you in for treatment? And you make a list of all the problems that they are facing. And then for each of those problems, you come up with a way that that problem would be less of a problem. That's the goals for therapy. It's present-oriented, which means that we need to reduce your immediate distress and we need to focus on the here and now. That doesn't mean that we are not aware of their past. We cannot have a good cognitive conceptualization of an individual without understanding their history. But we don't need a year of conversations to understand their history. We might have a couple of conversations and have a very clear perspective on their history. However, for those more chronic severe patients that have struggled for a long time, often working from a present orientation is not enough. It's where we start. And when much of our distress does come from earlier experiences, we often do have to go back from a historical perspective and take another look at those earlier experiences and look at the attributions, those automatic thoughts that we had about those earlier experiences and evaluate the validity of the perspective that we had. And that can take a longer period of time. For some patients, we know that a short course of therapy is all they need. For other individuals, therapy might take a very long time before they're really sure and solid. And for some individuals, we know that ongoing booster sessions are essential for mood stability to be sustained. But it's got to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. There's even some data to su suggest that it can be contraindicated to have long-term therapy. For instance, in the borderline personality disorder, Greg Brown's research showed us that after a year of therapy, once patients were discharged from treatment, they continued to improve. So by keeping these individuals in treatment, we might actually be doing them a disservice and compromising their ability to continue to improve. CBT is an educational model. It's based on teaching individuals how to help themselves. So education takes place in every conversation, which means that when somebody walks out of your office, they need to be able to say, what did I gain from this conversation? What did I learn? Every CBT session, some learning takes place. And in my personal patients, I know that they've gained something from our conversation when, number one, they can tell me what they've learned, they can summarize. But most importantly, I will ask them, when you're leaving here today, how are you going to think differently this week, and what are you going to do differently this week? Reviewing the key features of treatment, we start with a conceptualization of the individual, and the problem. We do a thorough diagnostic evaluation so that we understand, for instance, if it's an anxiety disorder, we need to understand what the content of fear is 
So we know, are we treating obsessive compulsive disorder? Are we treating social phobia? For instance, the person that says, I'm afraid to get on an airplane. It may be a specific phobia, the fear the plane's going to crash. And when they're not on a plane, they're fine. But it might be something very different. It might be the person getting on the airplane is afraid that they're going to have to use the bathroom. And they'll be in there for an extended period of time. And how embarrassing that will be. That's the social phobic on the airplane. Or maybe the person is afraid they're going to get an urge to fling the emergency door exit open and jump out of the plane. Right? That's the OCD patient. So a thorough diagnostic evaluation says that we need to understand the content of the problem in thinking. We need to understand, is it obsessive compulsive disorder or is it severe depression? Because in severe depression, you're going to evaluate the negative bias over and over until you've thoroughly disputed the distorted perspective. Whereas, whereas in, whereas in CBT, we also are careful to make sure that we have a therapeutic alliance. There is no question that we are asking these people to tell us their secrets. In order to do that, they have to trust us and they have to know we're not going to share their secrets with everyone else. It also needs to be agenda focused. That's how we know we're going to get what we say we're going to accomplish accomplished. It is problem solving and orientation and we do evaluate thoughts and beliefs, summarize the work all throughout and at the end of the session. And very importantly, homework is assigned. And homework is assigned because it's based on the model. The model says I'm teaching you to be your own therapist. And if you don't put these principles into practice, then you will not be able to count on yourself. And in fact, Rob DeRubis did a very nice study that showed us that the better the quality of the homework, the better the prognosis. So now we have an empirical basis to make sure that homework is a part of what we do. And it's interesting when we think about relapse prevention, what we're really saying is that when we do CBT, we are preventing them from relapse from the beginning of treatment. Let's look at that structure. So we, we check in on their mood because, again, it's empirical. Are they getting better? Are they improving? Are they not improving? Because if they're not improving, we need to change things up. Are we goal-directed? Which means we can set an agenda. We can decide what we're going to work on today. And we can make sure and recognize that each session is linked with every other session. We talk about what we say we're going to talk about. We summarize it. We give homework. And we get feedback. Let's look specifically at the cognitive therapy rating scale. When we look at the cognitive therapy rating scale, this is the tool that we use to decide whether the session represents CBT. It is the instrument that we use to credential individuals. It is, the inner, it is the tool we use for fidelity ratings in outcome trials across the country. It is the instrument that will be used in your work samples to really be able to objectively evaluate is what you're doing cognitive behavior therapy. So on each of these items, it's an 11 item scale, each item is independent of every other item. So you can get a zero on the first item and a perfect six on the next item. And each score you can get zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and you just see the anchors represented here. But you can get the scores in between, and there is a manual that you can have access to at the Academy of Cognitive Therapy website that gives you very specific details on what we will be looking for in this Cognitive Therapy Rating Scale. And I do recommend that everybody read the Cognitive Therapy Rating Scale manual. It is really the Bible on this is what a cognitive behavior therapy session looks like. But know that even though we are reading work samples and we are looking at it through this lens, clearly therapist judgment is the most important thing. So I will agree that there are times when you might actually do poorly on one of these items because in your professional opinion it makes sense. For instance, if you have a suicidal patient or a homicidal client, you're not going to be collaboratively talking about what you might talk about today. You're going to go right after the hopelessness that's driving the suicidal intent if they're suicidal. 
So forget about having a collaborative agenda, but clearly what you're doing therapeutically makes sense. So keep that in perspective. But ideally, a good agenda is you've established goals for treatment, you've decided to work on a specific goal, you've established what topic related to that goal you're going to be discussing, you've prioritized your topics, you've done it collaboratively, and you've actually talked about what you said you were going to talk about. Item two is label feedback, but keep in mind that this is a much more important item than just getting feedback on how the session was, because feedback says, did the person understand the learning? Did the person gain something from this experience? To me, this is the most important item on the entire cognitive therapy rating scale, because this item says, did work get accomplished? Every time something took place in that session, was the client able to say, this makes sense, I get it. And then can they actually say, here is what I learned. And if the client can't say what they learned, it is your job as the therapist to make it explicitly clear what you were hoping they were going to learn from your conversation, or to guide them with nice questions towards a conclusion that you want to make sure they are able to have. And we not only do these capsule summaries throughout the session every time learning is taking place, but at the end of the session, we summarize. And we summarize the content, not the process. Now, there are times when summarizing the process might be good as well. But it's not just a matter of saying, OK, today we talked about the dysfunctional thought record and we talked about your dad. That is not a very helpful summary. What did we learn as a result of talking about the dysfunctional thought record? Maybe we learned how to use it. We can summarize those points. But what was the content that was learned? We learned that although dad has a, does a really lousy job showing me that he cares about me, the reality is I know that he loves me and he cares. And he does show me in the only way he knows how. Understanding. Understanding gets back to that conceptualization. Do you have a Doctor. So understanding says I uh, means that I want to hear in a word sample verbatim the patient's internal reality. That means that you're probably not going to be doing CBT if you're not taking notes. Because you need to put in quotes word for word their words. That's how you understand them. When you paraphrase, you change the nuance of the meaning. So you're going to be restating their words exactly. When you were in this specific situation, you were thinking word for word what they are thinking. The second thing is that we want to make sure that you understand their problem. So again, we want to know that the cognitive model is operating. Interpersonal effectiveness. You know, and again, I would say that this is a rather subjective item, and that's why you don't have to have a perfect score to be doing good, solid CBT. And I might also say that on any one of these items, a score of four is considered competent. And that's what we're looking for, competency. So we're talking here about, about understanding how to interpersonal effectiveness and interpersonal effectiveness means that we're looking for cues from the patient that says, you know, you're not rubbing me the wrong way, or they've gotten angry, or they've tuned you out. So we want to make sure that we're on track in that kind of way. The other thing that we want to keep in mind with is that, as I was saying, a four is competency. There's 11 items. A score of 44 is competent, solid CBT. You know, a 40 is actually considered a passing score because we don't have perfect alpha reliability on every item. But know that if you're delivering a score in the, up, you know, in the high 40s, early 50s, you know, low 50s, you're really starting to deliver a level of CBT that is a level of excellence. But if I was running an outcome trial and you were scoring a 44, I'd be very happy to have you in my trial because you're delivering solid, acceptable CBT. If we look at the next item, collaboration, when we think about collaboration, collaboration is, a, is essential to the CBT process. That 
that CBT, that when we use collaboration, we know that we are working as a team, that we're not here simply to fix the person, that we are here, and it also engages the person in the treatment process and makes sure that they're part of the process and they are invested in their own recovery and their own wellness. We also want to do this work in a timely fashion. You know, time is money and we don't have a lot of it. And the truth is that we can do this work in an efficient way, which why you don't spend 20 minutes just chit-chatting with each other. Why in a very short period of time, within minutes, you've decided what you're going to work on and you get to work on it. That's what good pacing is. We also know that sometimes there are exceptions for why you might want to chit-chat with somebody or you might want to, you have an adolescent that doesn't really want to be there. And before you can get to work, you might have to talk about the latest video game. So I'm not saying that you don't need to do the things that make for good therapy, but ideally when we're looking at it through this lens, we're looking for work taking place as efficiently and throughout the entire work sample. So we're looking at, now guided discovery is absolutely one of the key principles. This is what defines CBT, is that we don't prescribe, we don't, people don't sit around waiting to be fixed, the medical model, we're going to prescribe an intervention. We don't tell people how to think, we don't interpret, we guide them to understanding. Now, Insight is not enough, because if you're not going to apply the principles in a way to move towards more effective behavior, you're still going to wind up struggling. But absolutely an essential part of CBT is to be able to use the principles of guided discovery. And what that means, instead of simply asking somebody, is there another way to look at it? Because if they knew another way to look at it, or saying to a depressed person, is there evidence that something positive is going on? They can't answer those questions. Depressed people can only see negative information. They can't consider the positives. They can't see the alternative explanations. And here is the true art of CBT. Because instead of asking them to be able to see the alternatives or look at the data, we guide them to see the alternatives. We guide them to see the data. And that's what the Socratic questioning process is that we guide them through questions that often we know the answer to, to help them see the data that they're not aware of. The person that says, I'm doing a bad job, instead of saying, well, is there any evidence that you're not doing a bad job, you ask them, what's the last piece of work you did? Did your boss tell you it was unacceptable? Did they throw it back at you? Was it red inked? Was the work acceptable? Did anybody give you any feedback on that work? So we guide them to understanding. And we do that by the next item, focusing on the key cognitions and behaviors. That we don't just examine any old thought that pops up, we examine the thoughts that are driving the distress, and even more importantly, we drive the underlying assumptions and pervasive negative core beliefs that led them to the negative thoughts to begin with, and examine the validity of those. And yes, we are working at both a cognitive behavioral level of change. If we look at the next slide, strategy. When we're looking at strategy, what that means is that we have a cognitive conceptualization of the problem, and most importantly, we have shared that conceptualization with the client themselves. You are depressed, and when a person is depressed, they are negatively biased. Share that conceptualization. And what we're going to be doing here in therapy is removing the bias. We're going to help you look at situations more clearly and accurately. So we're going to look at your thoughts and we're going to decide, is this thought really true? Is it partially true? Or maybe it's completely untrue. And it's driving all this upset unnecessarily. If we're doing exposure work, we're making sure that the clients understand the basic principles of exposure. And we talk about how important it is to have intensity and duration and frequency. And we give them a rationale for everything that we're going to be doing, which is good collaboration. But also by giving them that rationale, it says, I understand your problem, and you're going to understand your problem as well. In the next slide, we talk about application of 
of the principles. And you know, this is what are we applying CBT principles in a reasonable way? Remember, each item is scored independent of all the other items. So if you're applying the principle in a reasonable way, that's all we're asking. Are you doing a role play? Are you evaluating the thoughts? Are you helping them get behaviorally activated? If you're applying the skills very skillfully, you're applying the, you're, you're directly linking it to the broader understanding of the client. And last, we are utilizing homework as a tool, number one, to link all the work we're doing, to make sure that over time we're gaining in, in, in skill and we're gaining in equipping the person and we're not just putting out brush fires and that the person is really practicing these skills so that they don't leave therapy and relapse, so that they leave therapy and they sustain the gains. And we know that if you continue to do the work, you're going to continue to move towards wellness and you're going to continue to even grow to a better place than maybe you even were at before you started the therapeutic process. So 11 items, all you need is a 40 to reach confidence. I've given you a couple of references to look at, and I think at this point I'd like to open the floor to any specific questions. Thanks, Dr. Sokol. Uh, this is Natalie. We have received some questions mostly about sharing the slides and uh, I didn't know if we could send out a copy of your slides to the participants of the webinar or if... Um, yes, if you send them out as a PDF, you can send them to everybody. As a PDF, I can certainly do this. So several people asked about that, and so I will send those out to uh, everyone that, that is signed up for being on the webinar, but also those who are on my distribution list. Okay. Uh, another question is the website information for accessing the CBT rating scale. You had mentioned that everybody should read it and look at it. Uh, is that on the ACT website? Yes, that is on the ACT website. You can, okay. you can find that on the ACT website. Okay. Um, those are the only questions I see so far. Does anybody else have any questions about the presentation thus far. And maybe I can ask the audience, does anybody have automatic thoughts themselves about submitting these work samples? Because <laughs> maybe I can demystify some of that or, uh, you know, provide some kind of reassurance here. <laughs> Some people are saying definitely yes to your question. Um, we do have another uh, question coming in, Dr. Sokol. How long does the submitted session need to be? Is there any time frame you can give them? Okay, so, you know, this is interesting, especially now that CPT codes have changed. I mean, if we go by government regs, a standard therapy session, we're looking at a 45-50 minute therapy hour. So we're looking for a 45-50 minute therapy hour. But the reality is that if you're if you're in a work setting where you provide 25-minute therapy sessions, for instance, and that is the standard in the setting you're in, whether maybe it's home visits or maybe it's an inpatient, whatever the setting is, then as long as you put a little note that the standard of practice in my facility is a 25-minute session, that's fine. As long as all the components are there, that's fine. But we're looking for about a 45-minute therapy session. Okay. Um, and, and know that, you know, I can't say enough how important structure is. You know, when you're rating a work sample, the first half of the items really say, is the structure there? Did you set an agenda? Did you summarize? Did you assign some homework? Is the structure there? You know, the qualitative work is the sophistication of how it's delivered. Did you elicit the key cognitions? Did you work on the most important thoughts and behaviors? Did you do it in a reasonable way using the guided discovery process? But don't make any errors in, in missing out on the structure. So you do all that really good, intensive, solid work, but you forget about the structure. So just keep in mind you need both of those pieces. So 
you know, don't send a tape where you didn't talk about homework because that's going to get you at a zero. That's going to lose you six points that didn't need to happen. I think that actually answers one of the next questions. Um, someone asked, how do you rate number 11 homework if uh, homework has not been assigned? So what you're saying, Dr. Sobel, is don't, do not uh, send in that tape if yeah, homework wasn't a part of it. don't send in that tape because it's not going to be an attractive score. Okay. Now, it might be that there wasn't homework from the time before, and that will also detract from your score on that item. Because to get a good score on that item, you're not only assigning relevant homework for the work that was covered in that given session, but you also talked about homework from previous time. Okay. Uh, this leads to another question. What if your session is an initial session because you are staffed in a crisis stabilization unit? Is assigning homework for transitioning to outpatient setting appropriate? Is, is assigning them homework when you're going to a different setting appropriate? Yeah. Or is well, that the best take? First, first of all, I want to say that yes, it's, it can be appropriate to assign. Dr. Beck, senior, does consultation sessions all the time and sends people with a giant list of things that they need to work on. So it, it, even if you're not going to personally be following up on that homework, it is appropriate. However, it is not appropriate to send a one-time uh, crisis intervention session for rating. This instrument was not designed to evaluate a crisis intervention session. You know, this was really uh, designed for sessions from number two forward. So it would not be used in a diagnostic interview, it would not be used in a crisis interview, it would not be used in a very first session, nor would it be used in a termination session, your last session. It would, be a, it would have to be a session that took place during the course of treatment. So that might be a little bit of a problem for those individuals that only get one and done. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of technical questions about how to submit the audio session. Um, can it be an audio file, a CD, upload? What, what is your uh, requirement there? Yes, so you can, you can send a CD Actually, or can you I, can, can I just, send an audio Can I just interject? I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, the, um, the file needs to be a digital format. Uh, that allows us to transfer the file safely and securely and quickly. Um, there will be an additional surcharge uh, to cover postage costs if you have to use a CD, but the, um, the preferred format is a WAV file, a WMA file, or an MP3 file, which can be uploaded to our secure Dropbox. Okay, thank you. And all of that is explained in, in the contracts. So whenever uh, an entity contracts with the Academy of Cognitive Therapy to conduct its ratings, that information is then uh, communicated and, and ex explained. And, Troy, and I think that's a, this is this is Trina. I'm sorry. That's a good point to make, Troy. So just just be aware it, that applies specifically to the Academy of Cognitive Therapy if you're contracting specifically with, with them. Um, the other two entities that we've endorsed as a state may have other requirements or other caveats that they um, or, or parameters or guidelines to follow um, regarding those pieces. That was that would be something you have to specifically address with those um, those other organizations. And Troy, while you're on, can you tell them exactly where they can find the cognitive therapy rating scale on the website? I, I submitted a um, uh, a link, but it's um, it's uh, it's something I can I don't know if I can send it to everyone, but it's it's www.academyofct.org forward slash diplomate forms, and it's uh, it's in the candidate handbook. Okay. Um, there are a couple of other questions about submitting a first session, and it sounds like, Dr. Sobel, that that's not the best if uh, it's an option. Somebody wants to know, if it is a first session, what is the best you can rate on homework? You obviously wouldn't have had any from the previous yeah, I session. Mean, I, I really want to say, I, I really want to discourage, it, the, the instrument is not designed to rate a very first session, and I would not be submitting a first session. And if we're in a situation where we have a, a unique kind of experience, then we'll be involved in having a conversation about how to handle that. But don't, don't have anyone submit a first session without first okay. talking to us about what we can maybe do if we're in a, a pickle with what kind of work samples they have. What if they just didn't do the homework from the previous session? How would That's you fine. want a therapist to it? How would you want the therapist to address that, though? Yeah. So you know, as long as there is some kind of conversation. So it may be, 
you know, it may just be acknowledged, you know, I see you didn't get around to doing the homework. If we have time today, would it be all right if we chat a little bit about that? Maybe you had more important things than to talk about the homework that didn't take place. So that's valid. Or maybe the homework was something really essential. It was exposure work. And if they don't face their fear, they're never going to overcome it. So then we would expect that on the agenda there would be a note, you know, I would, if it's all right with you, how about if we spend some time today talking about the fact that you never got around to doing that exposure work we had said you were maybe going to try and make happen. And then you can talk about it. What got in the way? Was it too threatening? Um, did you let other things take a priority? And then, and then it's something you wind up spending some time talking about. But it's more important that you decide whether you're going to talk about it or not than whether you actually talk about it. Okay. Um, here's an interesting one. What if the session is in Spanish? Troy? <laughs> Uh, we do have we we can we can rate Spanish samples and have so far um, the feedback will be in Spanish as well. So I mean I don't see that obviously as being a problem, but um, we can accept samples in Spanish. We do ask for a slightly longer time to get results returned, um, but uh, we can rate samples in Spanish. Okay. And the other entities as well do rate in Spanish as well, or can listen to Spanish sessions. All right. Uh, one therapist is getting a lot of clients who want to chit chat quite a bit, and they're having a difficult time getting them back on track. What's the most appropriate way to get them back on track uh, during that session? Yeah, so, you know, this is true with a lot of patients, and it really is the skill of the therapist to be able to jump in. Now, you have a couple of different paths. You could say, you know, uh, you could tell them right from the beginning, you know, I'm going to interrupt you a lot when we're talking with each other. But the reason I'm doing that is because I really want to understand your problem in a way that I can intervene in the most effective way possible. So you can set that up right from the beginning. But when people are going on and on, you can intervene without even telling them you're going to intervene by, you know, saying, oh, you know, tell me more. But then you can guide what they're telling you. By asking them, you know, what were you thinking when that person said that? And what was your body experiencing? Was your heart beating? What did you do next? And so the person wants to keep talking. So it's not like you've shut them down, but now you've guided the information that they're giving you to be more productive for how you can help out. All right. Um, somebody wants to know how long, uh, for a depressive uh, disorder individual, how long does it usually take for the individual to begin to overcome the negativity and begin their recovery process? Right, uh, so they add, I can see how long how uh, the person may need encouragement by offering hope for potential outcomes of the therapy. Right. So, you know, first of all, we can't say for any individual person. We know that the average person in about three months is going to have remission of their depressive symptoms and acute depressive onset. You know, and I think you can say, listen, you can't, you can't give anybody a guarantee, but you can say, you know, we have a lot of data with a lot of people that are experiencing symptoms like you are that respond very favorably to this treatment. And you can say, listen, right now, you don't even have to embrace the alternative viewpoint. All I want you to know from the very first session forward is just because you think something doesn't mean it's necessarily true. And in the beginning, I'm going to ask you to pay attention to these negative thoughts, which might actually, in fact, make you feel worse. Because if you look at the ugliness, you're going to feel even worse. But if you keep the perspective that just because I think it doesn't make it true, then those upsetting thoughts are going to be just a little less upsetting. Okay. Um, I'm going to interject. Okay. I'm going to interject. This is Trina from DSHS. We are actually at 201. So we are just a little bit over time. Um, I, I know we could go on and on talking about this because this is a lot of great, great information that Dr. Sokol has presented today. Um, I think what we can do um, is do our best to try and respond to the remaining questions that we haven't got, gotten um, to answer today. Um, and also at some point, I believe, um, there will be um, a link available to, for folks to, to review this, um, this webinar again. If they, ch if they choose to do so, um, and as per um, what Dr. Sokol mentioned, 
that we can make this PowerPoint available um, in PDF as well um, as additional follow-up so you guys can have that as a resource. So um, I think at this point um, we will be closing the webinar. Um, but asked, if anybody um, Trina, there was one person who asked, uh, please have him type it out. Can you, um, because we have so many questions coming at once, I'm not sure what you're referring to. If you want to send it again and tell me uh, what that refers to, we can do that. Um, okay, got it, got it. And we can answer the rest of these maybe via email uh, and send it out to all the people who are, who are here and also to that same distribution list, Trina. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Okay. So, so thank you, everybody, for participating today. We really appreciate, as I said, the interest um, and your attentiveness and the questions that you've asked. And thank you, Dr. Sokol, for, um, for, for being, um, being on with us today. And thank you to the Academy um, for helping us um, facilitate this process, as well as UT Health Science Center for your collaboration on this as well. Great. Thank you so much for having me. All right, everyone. Thank you.